Hello everyone. Let's have a basic lesson here on Olmec culture. This will be part of unit two that looks at various regions during the formative period in Mesoamerica. This uh, reading in the co-textbook format is going to be in the co-Mexico book because this is part of that Isthmian zone that you've been learning out with maps. Okay, let's go. Olmec culture is an example of a well-documented early chiefdom. And as we go along, we'll define this a little bit more closely, but this means there is a form of centered leadership that we can easily see from the layout of certain communities in this zone. They are major innovators of many ceremonial complex activities that we see carried over and expanded upon by neighbors, including the Maya, the Mokaya, and uh, elsewhere in Central and Highland Mexico. We're just going to take a look at two phases of Olmec culture and really mainly just take a look at two large scale archeological sites in detail and one archeological site that uh, we want to take a look at because some amazing things were found that are well preserved. The earlier of these two phases is termed San Lorenzo, which I just typed in SL here because I know you're going over it with your key terms in reading. This begins to be a well-established, highly constructed and used center at approximately 1,200 years before the current era, and seems to fade away as a center of leadership at approximately 900 years before the current era. The secondary phase moves to a slightly further south area, and that particular site, again, very well investigated over a long period of time, the site of La Venta, 900 years before the current era to approximately 400 years in the current era, when it seems to be as an administrative and highly ranked ritual center, uh, no longer of its same uh, mega importance. This zone is also known as Olman, and you might see that, although I do not believe that I've put together any readings where you're going to see that, but perhaps if you're doing some traveling or uh, online investigation. The zone here, as you can see in the map, is really tightly centered along the coastline zone of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec area where the Coatzacoalcos River is draining out into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, further to the north, there are other sites that are labeled and you're gonna take a look and see uh, these in your map activity, including a site with amazing large-scale sculptures known as Tres Zapotes and another known as Laguna de los Cerros. On your maps and geography, you are also taking a look for the location of the Tuxlas Mountains or Tuxlas Highlands. Uh, these will be important, as mentioned in your reading, as the source of much of their heavier stone material. San Lorenzo, as you can see, is at the southern end of the Coatzacoalcos River and is there along close to a number of other really important sites, not of the, um, not of the size of San Lorenzo uh, here, and is close by, as you can see there in that central zone, to the site of El Manati, which we'll come back to. And La Venta, again, is another site a little bit even further to the south across the state line. So La Venta is not located in the state of Veracruz. It is the next state over, which you're looking up. So I'm not gonna throw that term out there because I know you're labeling that and working on it. Uh, if we take a look at a type of map here, now to the right-hand side, 
where the uh, deeper green color is going to be altitude, then you can see again that both San Lorenzo and La Venta are in the flatlands and are not uh, zones where there's anything much going on in altitude or volcanoes producing uh, the amazing uh, types of rocks and minerals that they're looking for. But the Tushlas Mountains there are higher altitude, um, more sources of basalt and uh, obsidian, and then also a very important lake zone uh, to this particular culture. One of the things that we're looking at in detail in our course is the way that the relationship between their survival, and we're looking at all of the cultures uh, in our course are agriculturalists, which means that they're growing their own food with domesticated plants. As their agriculture uh, becomes more productive, then we also see that as their populations grow, that societies become more complex. And this would be in terms of the amount of considerations of things like trade, relationships within other villages or other linguistic groups or societies, management of various social groups in society, and here in the middle of the formative period, and we'll be looking at this primarily within uh, the Mokaya um, society in southern Guatemala, and here this one, the Olmec, where we can clearly see that there are families of individuals in the communities who ain't outrank others and become decision makers or leaders when needed or in certain circumstances. So these would be considered complex societies. In your text, uh, again, they're mentioning the role of the beginnings of chiefdom style leadership as they go. A really useful quote here from some of our readings and materials um, includes the phrase monumental construction. Monumental construction in all its phases uses lots of labor and people in egalitarian societies do not, as a rule, produce such monuments because there's no effective means for organizing and marshalling a large labor force. Let's think about that for a moment. For the very large scale structures that you'll be looking at as you go through the reading, things like uh, platform pyramids, things like uh, large buildings that are constructed on large platforms, the cleaning out and leveling of very wide open spaces, and really clear when we take a look at their um, art, particularly sculpturing in stone for the Olmec, the importation of tons and tons of heavy stone into their community areas where the stones are not locally available means that there has to be a way to get a large number of people to work together on an activity that isn't going to directly feed your own family or directly build your own house or directly solve some of your other single family or extended family needs. Societies where families individually manage their issues are what we call egalitarian here, egalitarian. In egalitarian societies, there are no common forms of leadership where the leaders are always more highly regarded or always outranking the rest of people. So each time we see the construction for these uh, larger communities with larger, heavier, and fancier buildings and areas, then we can see that we have further evidence of rulership in the form of chiefdoms with considerable power. Okay, again, egalitarian, the term egalitarian leadership structure means that 
Each household has its own basic leadership structure that there isn't any form of centralized politics. This would need to be in an egalitarian society, such as you're looking at um, in this unit, for instance, at Tlatilco or at Chupicuero, or it seems to be uh, earlier phases there in ancient West Mexico. We have it that all the households must decide to get together and uh, manage things together. With egalitarian societies, most of the individuals are uh, living in communities where pretty much all of the housing is very, very similar and their subsistence, right, their um, agriculture using milpa structure, uh, the corn, bean, squash, and many other crops is going to be, for the most part, raising what your family needs on a year-to-year -year basis. In all cases, though, when we have these settled down communities, there typically is two types of constructions that are just everywhere. One, a central house that seems like a meeting place, sometimes termed a chief's house, and secondarily, a ball court, where the community comes together for those types of activities. Are the old Merrick an egalitarian society where individual households are making the decisions uh, and needing to come together? In fact, they are not. They are clearly, as you go through the reading and take a look at sites like San Lorenzo and La Venta, they are clearly a chiefdom moving towards a more stratified or ranked society. What can we see in terms of things put together in your notes and organization of outlines as you go through and answer some questions later on in the unit? How do we know that the Olmec chiefs had power over a very large labor, labor force? Well, the projects such as gargantuan buildings, gargantuan sculptures, and the fact that, for instance, buildings open areas for meeting place, marketing areas would require in this particular zone pretty much a yearly upkeep and update because this is an area with very, very heavy rain, extremely high humidity, very, very warm. So the incursion of plants, baby trees, fungus, wind, and so forth would require, there has to be some centralized organization for how they're going to repair and maintain these things. What else might we see? Well, as you go through, we will come around and take a look at a few of these. Okay, so the Olmec are a chiefdom, a stratified society. In your reading and for much of what we're going to look at in examples, we're going to be focusing on different types of icons or ritual representations that we see in art, whether that is sculpted, whether that is ceramics, whether that is engraved onto boulders, painted onto things and so forth. There's a number of these. As you go through this reading, and some of you may have taken a look at this in maybe an art history class, we see many images of an individual that's labeled wear jaguar. In other words, a human that metamorphs or turns into having features of a jaguar. Those are also frequently uh, labeled howling babies. We'll look at some examples of these as we go. They're not fully human, but they are not fully animals either because this is part of their spiritual um, organization. The Olmec earth monster, sometimes called dragon. An icon known as St. Andrew's Cross. Obviously, this is culturally labeled, right? This is, couldn't possibly be what they were originally labeled, but this is how you might be able to find them if you do a little uh, data search. Images of a hand, paw, and wing complex. The flaming eyebrows, which actually may be actually flaming. 
the cleft head, which we'll look at a couple of examples of here, meaning it looks like a person or a supernatural individual has been struck in the center of the uh, center of the forehead with an axe, not killing the individual, but clefting or making a V-shape indentation. And then something's going on with the uh, gums. Rather than having teeth there, we just see gums like we might see in a baby. All right. So two ways to organize our thoughts. And you are uh, taking a look and your uh, reading is very, very well illustrated, as you've already seen. And you can use the outline uh, organizer uh, handouts that I leave in Canvas for you, too, to organize your notes and make it a little bit more simple for you. We can see that the Olmec uh, art can be divided into two subdivisions. These will be based on the size of the material and thematic content. Not what they're made out of, but again, what are the themes and how large are they? So first one is frequently labeled monumental. This is going to be things that are quite large, placed in the public so that they will be visible to all that come into certain open public areas. Monumental pieces thematically relate to things that have to do with political matters, for instance, images of chiefs or leaders of lineages or recalling activities that the leadership or chiefdom enacts. And the second group is often labeled portable. These are going to be smaller. It doesn't mean tiny, but smaller. These are going to be objects that clearly have images. And we'll just use this term cult. It's nothing negative from our perspective. It means that they're going to have images of supernatural beings or activities or symbols. These were traded widely, and we do find them all the way into Pacific coast of Guatemala, all the way up into the central Mexican highlands during the formative period. Thematically, porticable art, again, is going to relate to religious beliefs or concepts. But the objects themselves may be things like cups or bowls or things that might be worn with a cord around the neck, for instance, or tied or linked into a headdress or clothing. All right, so last time, monumental, large scale things. Obviously, these could have been moved because they had to import the materials, but once they're placed in a very important public location, that is where they la are left for prolonged periods of time. And then portable, things that are used in rituals or uh, are remembrance of ritual or ideas, and they're often traded away to other zones. All right, quickly again, would you have this in your note? The Olmec region, is the homeland is in the, the location close to San Lorenzo and La Venta, but eventually many of their themes and items that uh, recall the artistic style or some of these religious concepts are found further south into the region known as Soconusco down there, which is Pacific Coastal, uh, the state of Chiapas and Guatemala. Okay, the most famous of the items of monumental art are these five categories. We aren't going to look at them in detail here in this lesson, but your reading does go over them. Colossal heads, single carved boulders into the face and headdress of someone important. Seated figures. Seated figures are clearly those that have a leadership role in rituals, and we see as we look at them that they indicate transformation 
by shamanic leadership. Thrones. These are large rectangular stone blocks. They have carving all around the um, front and two sides. They used to be called in the literature altars, but it is very clear now that leaders, leaders sat upon them to raise themselves up and be able to be seen by the audience or their followers. The term called stila, a stila, we're not gonna worry about whether that means one or multiples in this course. A stila is a single stone column and some of these are blank. Um, but some of them have uh, very detailed carvings on them that show public scenes of leadership in action, and then uh, carving right into boulders. Uh, for instance, the very famous boulder sculpture found at Chalcatzingo in another zone of Mexico today. Some details for you on colossal heads. The colossal heads are all made from a volcanic origin stone known as basalt. It's very dense, very heavy, and it is not local to the large communities that we're looking at. They were needing to go quite some distance to find those boulders and then drag, roll, and float them back. You have this in your, your reading. Overwhelmingly, Experts in the field today, no matter what country they might be currently living in, do acknowledge that these are ruler, chief, or lineage founder portraits, even though it doesn't show the rest of the body. It's possible that they are wearing headdresses that are linked to ball player garb, but it might be something else. Again, these are fantastically old, almost. 2,500 to 3,000 years old, and so we are never going to know all of the uh, dynamics of these, but it's possible. Size. The smallest ones are a meter and a half tall to almost three meters tall, and almost three meters tall would be approximately nine feet tall. The salt is very dense. The small ones are seven to eight tons. The biggest one is 75 tons. So a ton is 2,000 pounds or 900 kilos, and therefore the biggest one weighs 150,000 pounds, and it was brought from a long distance away to where they finally uh, began to carve it and place it in a public uh, location. And they were pushing, pulling, and rolling it through an area that has very soft, muddy, um, wet soils. So a very large number of people had to participate in this. And to just com uh, compare it to other things that we know of as very large in our society, a large adult African elephant only weighs the size of one of the Olmec colossal heads, and that would be one of the smaller ones. The largest is known as the Kobata head. And here it is in an image here. Now, this is the, the largest, so super colossal head. And this one is incredibly important because it was not completed. For whatever reason, the carving started and then they finished. But the most important part for us as we look at it today is to see how they actually designed the layout of the face. What was the shape of the boulder? And how did they place the facial features? One of the things mentioned in many aspects um, uh, from experts is that there are people from other places and outside of this cultural zone or outside of these experts that have suggested that the Olmec are actually Africans but they are not. There is no data of any type that indicates that there was any migration or in movement of people one to 2,000 years before the current era from Africa. In fact, 
what we see here is that the shape of the upper lip and the nose and the eyes is that they are doing minimal engraving into a really hard boulder that's already kind of flattened on the edges. And in Olmec uh, artistic design, you will see that a very heavy downward turned upper lip is something that they found on many, many things. Uh, it's just part of their artistic style. So this one's really important. It shows us how they were able to do it. So these are not chipped, they are engraved. They are right grinding into it with another hard stone over and over and over again. So this is why there's not a lot more undulation of the features. It would have taken a very long time to create this. Uh, image of the Chalkatzingo boulder sculpture is also another really important one for us to look at. Briefly here, we can see, here's the eyes on this piece. Here's another eye, upper lip, right, with that downward curve nasal opening right here and then we see that the lower jaw opens up here it is down here and this particular living uh, supernatural is the living landscape which you learned in unit one about the way that they're seeing an animistic universe in this case the supernatural entity opens up its mouth and here we can see the four sides right and then the center this is that quatrefoil quincunx that you saw in unit one as well at the edges of the face we see these plants growing here again life coming from the earth coming from the ground. Over here on the illustration side, we see a different sculpture here showing the same supernatural entity, but in this case from the side. Here's the eye, the nose, the upper lip going down, and then the lower lip. And inside of the mouth, right inside of this living mountain, is a chief sitting on a throne holding some other cultural icons but again these plants here now above these looks like upper lips here in Olmec art these are clouds we see that they are raining and here's droplets of things falling down into the earth so again living maintaining uh, life and recognizing in Olmec art that life comes from the ground and then recycles up into the skies Portable art, real quickly here. Now, the most common one we'll probably see in the time that we have for, for this little part of the unit are going to be images of the wear jaguar or howling baby motif. We see this on ceramic containers, on small stone portable objects, uh, carved into other items. We will look at and define the celt or votive axis, but again, in your reading and also in uh, the materials in Canvas, the quick video there, the Kunz axis, the most um, famous of them, named after someone who recognized that it was uh, very, very old and uh, did drawings and, and published on it. Sometimes there are flat plaques made out of typically green stone with this image on it because, again, green is the color of life, right? It's plants, it's grass, it's standing water. In fact, actually, the color terms in many of the languages of indigenous societies do not differentiate much between the colors of blue and green. Green is blue and green are life, and so that would link the sky with water, with living plants, and so forth. We can see these in figures and the Las Limas figure, which you also have in your reading, and we'll look at quickly here, is um, an, a figure holding the wear jaguar baby. Hollow ceramics, they're gonna look like um, clay figurines, ceramic containers, and wooden figures such as found at El Manati. Imagine this, we have 
wood, carved wood, preserved from this particular region and almost nowhere else that dates to 3,000 years ago. And then sometimes mirrors. Here's the Las Limas figure. Uh, we'll spend a little bit more moment here on this than any of the others. Now the Las Limas figure, here we can see if you take a look at it here to your left, the Las Limas figure is a seated adult who has, and take a look at all the way over to the right in the line drawing, who has essentially um, images, most likely tattoos, into that person's four corners, right? The two shoulders and the two knees. And what we see are four supernaturals with the cleft head, with the V-shaped notch in the forehead. See it here. These are four different individuals. For instance, we see one with a flaming eyebrow here, one uh, and all four of them have different shapes to the eyes. One here has really clearly a shark tooth coming out, but just one from the upper palate. This one has a bifurcated um, perhaps tongue or tooth coming out. This one, the crossed eyes and so forth. Now this individual also has very fancy amount of tattooing here on his face. It's clearly a younger male. He's holding in his arms as if he's going to lean forward and pass it forward. One of these so-called howling infants. You can see the infant face here. There are no teeth. So before the teeth have come out and so forth, um, very small sized. But this is not a human baby here. This plaque or badge on the chest and this image here on the abdomen with the crossed lines indicate that this is a very powerful ri ritual, um, supernatural entity. The Los Limas figure is the largest known greenstone figure from this particular region. Okay, Celts and votive axes. Real quickly here, but you can pause once you see the video and take a look a little more slowly. Celts and votive axes are essentially two terms for what are axe heads. These are axes that are used in rituals, not for work. You can see here on the one down here that the groove is often here of where they would attach that to a handle and then these would be carried um, and lifted above in uh, ceremonies or other emissives. These are often far, found in what we know of as caches, C-A-C-H-E-S. A cache is a buried ritual offering, buried items that are part of a ritual where you are putting important things back in to feed and invigorate the ground, which is where life comes from in Mesoamerican worldview. For instance, just what's been found at La Venta to date, and there's clearly going to be more if we ever can clear out more of the site, but they found about a thousand tons of worked and imported stone. None of these stones are local. And then they are either shaping them. If they're just shaped as to an ax head, we use the term votive ax. If they are carved to also have the face, arms, or other parts of a supernatural entity, then they call them, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is a votive ax here, right? We can see this bottom one, the one on the bottom, votive ax. And then if they're just like the axe head, but they don't have an image on them, we just call them celts in archaeology. This is all valuable stone material and the ones with the carving on them. And again, here in this one, we see the cleft head, flaming eyebrows. Here's the zone here again to attach the handle. But this part, the sharper narrow end, would be the part that would have struck into this individual's head to make the cleft. Very interesting combination of scenes here. These are very valuable. These could have been carved and used and then sent along 
for trade, for instance, or to exchange for um, materials from another area that has resources that you can't find in the Olmec area, yet they buried them. They buried them. So the worth of them to continued uh, ritual importance is large, but it also indicates that Olmec leadership was fabulously wealthy, that the leaders could ask their followers to obtain these, carve these, uh, empower them, and then essentially bury them where they would not have any further material use in someone's life. So again, cash is a buried offering. The most important or famous of these is the Laventa Celt Cash scene. Um, we know that they were buried in a very important area and that they knew where they were because at some point after they were initially buried, probably centuries later, someone opened up, dug down to about where their heads were, saw that they were still there and covered them up again. You have a video in Canvas about this to a little bit more detail, so we'll move along. So again, that Celt cash scene is Laventa offering four. Here you can see an image of them uh, when they are cleaned up and reorganized on a flat surface in a museum. This one is in the National Museum in um, Mexico City here. And we can see that they do show a group of individuals where some are clearly uh, choosing different colored stones to do this coming in lines towards these central individuals towards the back with a stone post fence in the background. Your reading will go through some more of the details for you. So again, Celt versus votive axe. If it's just like an axe head, they're usually gonna use that term Celt. This one has some carvings in it. And it's showing one of these um, belts that we see worn as a garment. If it is carved like it's a sculpted little figure like this one, this is the Kunsax, then we just use the term Vodivax. Wooden figures can't overexpress how rare it is for us today to find carved wood uh, that was used for anything in ancient Mesoamerica, but because the water is very, very shallow and these have stayed completely buried in super dense mud without a lot of opportunity for the oxygen to be there for decomposition, that at the site of El Manati, and this one will be closer to the site of San Lorenzo, they found a cache of wooden figures. And here we can see they're, they're bigger, but they're the same face and head feature as we saw in the stone objects as well, although these do not have the cleft head. So these are uh, more human looking than these. A number of these were found also with a tremendous volume of cached celts in green stone, big, heavy. Uh, had to be re uh, imported stone from another area because the stone that these are made of are not local. So trade relationships with people with other resources here. Um, again, you could see actually the people living in the local area did report this to the government authorities rather than digging them up themselves and selling them on the art market or keeping them for their own um, their own interests here. So these were able to be found. So these were located as part of a ritual where they were buried and then over the top the stone figures went in with a number of other items. The local people were trying to uh, dig piers to tie up their, uh, their wooden um, boats that they were using for fishing and moving around. But most important here, more rare even than wood, rubber. So we know that the Olmec were playing the ball game with rubber balls. These are a little bit shrunken from the size that they would have been because these are almost 3000 years old, but they found 12 of them. And we know that these are treated and developed latex. Latex is the natural rubber of it in order to survive. 
But one of the things that is important for us in the course is that we already know from these early formative villages that ball courts are found in all of them. And now we know that rubber balls were being formed. Not necessarily huge, not necessarily the same size everywhere, but rubber balls, amazing. Okay, so let's call this one done and you can attach this to your notes or other things that you're using. Thank you.